Hello, everyone. Good morning if you're in Brussels and good afternoon if you're joining us from Asia. And thank you for joining us for this conversation on Indonesia's G20 presidency priorities. I hope you're joining us from a country, a place where the sky is sunnier and brighter than it is here. I'm Shada Islam, I'm Senior Advisor at EPC, and we are delighted to have with us Ambassador Dian Transaya Jani, Indonesia's G20 co-sherpa, and also Special Advisor to the Minister for Foreign Affairs on Priority Issues. Ambassador Jani is Indonesia's former representative to the United Nations. Thank you, Ambassador Jani, for being here. Uh, also, Ambassador Hadi, thank you very much from the Indonesian Mission to the EU for facilitating this conversation. So before we start, also a quick word of thanks, as I said to Ambassador Hadi. And uh, let me start with a very simple question to you, uh, Pajani. The G20 presidency is, of course, a huge responsibility for a country at any time. But these are very challenging times. And of course, the responsibility is much bigger. Indonesia is the only Southeast Asian nation in the G20, and its presidency theme is simple but very ambitious. It's there behind you on the screen. Recover together, recover stronger. Now, that's a very inspiring slogan, if you like, Pajani, but I was wondering if you could give us some details of what exactly are your ambitions and your goal for the rest of the year. Well, first of all, to thank you, uh, Ibu Shada Islam, for uh, having me here today, and also to thank my dear colleague, Ambassador Andri Hadi, uh, for facilitating this uh, important conversation. Now, uh, going straight to the to the uh, question that we have posed, uh, Shada, um, you referred to the keyword responsibility, and this is the the main the main issue. We are now, uh, as you know, um, in the still in the midst of the pandemic, and therefore. Uh, that's why our team is recovered together, recover stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, this has the nuance of the togetherness. We have to collaborate together, all countries in the world, not only G20 members, but also others also. And we all also have to recover stronger, not only simply just uh, for the sake of recovery. Stronger meaning making sure that the world is a much better, better uh, place to be in. Uh, there are prosperity. And this is why we wanted to make sure that when we are in the in the helm of our, the presidency of the G20, we want to make sure that this nuance of recover together, recover stronger, has the nuance of being short uh, and long-term vision. Short meaning that we have to quick fix, uh, fixes to recover from this crisis. A uh, long-term meaning that the outcome of our deliverable must enable us to be resilient and sustainable in the future. Now, in doing so, um, we have to make sure that uh, the spirit of inclusivity is there, which is, of course, part of the DNA of, of Indonesia's diplomacy. For us, the G20 presidency, uh, we wanted to make sure that all are parties to the discussion, uh, not only the G20 members. As you know, we have always been the um, uh, proponent of developing countries since the Asia-Africa conference. Uh, the non-aligned, we're also the founders. And this is the first time that we're bringing also in the midst uh, countries from the, the small island countries like the CARICOM and the Pacific Island Forum. So in other words, we want to have uh, all stakeholders involved in the discussion. And this is also not only those that are in the engagement group, those that are vulnerable, those are, that are um, uh, from different parts and walks of life, private sectors, NGOs, as well as every, everyone. Now in doing so, what is more important is that you have to prioritize. And our priority, of course, is firstly in enhancing global health architecture. And the second is energy transition. And the third, of course, digital transformation. Right. Uh, Sada, giving a little glimpse of what we're saying here, that when we say about enhancing global health architecture, we want to make sure that, look, we are all still in the middle of the pandemic. So we have to make sure that uh, we are also being prepared in, in addressing, first of all, uh, recovering from the pandemic, but also in preparation for future, future pandemic. And that's why this global health architecture discussion is very crucial. Now on energy transition, um, our presidencies, I think we're way past on the discussion of whose fault is it on climate change, who has been uh, the culprit on addressing this issue of uh, um, uh, sustainable development. Uh, we are not going to be uh, bickering uh, on, on who's right to develop or developing countries. And besides the point, we wanted to address the issue by nipping it in the bud, trying to 
ensure that this issue of energy transition, if you are able to have a very smooth transition to a more sustainable use of the energy, uh, then automatically you will uh, uh, decrease the CO2 emission and of course addressing uh, the question of climate change. So the, the trick here, the keywords is trying to have collaboration on concrete issues that can be done. And this is also on the health issues when we're talking about a lot of things related to health. Then once again, uh, we have to address what's the problem. Is it the question of vaccine, accessibility, affordability, uh, dissemination of that? All of this has to be addressed. Now on the third part, when you're talking about the future uh, and now the world is already the millennial world. I mean, like it or not, the question of digital transformation is across the board in many of the discussion in all uh, G20. And that's why on our presidencies this year, this is the first time that we have a working group on digital economy, uh, which also addressed a lot of things. For instance, digital is also being addressed in the education health, it's in the working group on women, on labor and everything. So why not put it in one best basket? And then you discuss this question of uh, digital transformation. I think this is the crux of all the matters. Uh, when we are able to address it, uh, once again, uh, you're talking about financial and digital inclusion, then you're talking about MSE, small and medium enterprise, vulnerable groups, everything could be covered with this. I can go and on and on on this, but I think I leave it at that, but I think it's quite clear. But that doesn't mean uh, we are prioritizing only on these three issues. Of course, there are other issues that have been discussed right. following up the, the, the uh, various uh, previous uh, presidencies. And of course, once again, um, what is more important is like bringing the G20 to the people. Because the question that we have been asked, uh, and I'm having a little bit of a problem answering many questions from journalists, uh, is G20 is only this uh, club for government officials talking with each other. No, we wanted to make sure in our presidency that the common people, the people on the ground would have an impact on what we're doing. So that's why we're focusing on concrete deliverables. We don't want to talk about full stop and coma. We're not going to talk about lengthy uh, leaders declaration or ministerial declaration. We want to make sure that, look, let's walk the talk. Let's right. really come up with something concrete. I think that's the key point. I leave it at that. At well, point. thank you, Pajani. That was a very comprehensive uh, and complete response. And I just uh, want to say to all of you joining us, please, uh, I will be speaking to Pajani for about 25 minutes, but after that, there will be a Q&A session. So please, there is a Q&A box on your screen. All of us know how to use it. So do please send us some questions for uh, Ambassador. Um, Ambassador, you've talked a, a little bit about all of the key issues. Of course, you've talked about the health infrastructure. You've talked about energy transition and uh, about the digital economy. Let me take you a bit further into the three of these in a little bit more detail. Um, on uh, on uh, vaccines and the pandemic, et cetera, there are many, many issues that are on uh, the global agenda. There is, of course, the question of access to vaccines, the question of equity, production, manufacturing of vaccines in developing countries, question of the waiver for trips within the WTO. And then, as you yourself said, preparation, prepar preparedness, if you like, for whatever happens next, because this is not the last pandemic, unfortunately. So if you could talk us through these different ideas, where will you be putting the emphasis, as it were? Well, maybe I should start, uh, Ibu Sada, by, by elaborating that um, there is this uh, a particular paragraph in the Rome Declaration, which says that we have to reach 40% of global vaccination of the world. Uh, by end of 2021, and of course 70% by mid-2022. Uh, this is also the WHO target. Now, the fact remains that there are still 90 countries that did not reach the target of vaccinating 40% of their population, and 60, 36 of those countries have not yet vaccinated 10% of their population. Mm -hmm. uh, certain continents are having difficulties even reaching that 10%. Now, in the case of Indonesia, uh, alhamdulillah, we managed to do it on the 22nd of December, we, we counted that uh, we have reached more than 40%, almost 42% of our global, uh, of our vaccination of population. And we're talking about a country that are the fourth largest in terms of population. It's not an easy task, so to say. But we wanted to show also that, look, uh, we are not only preaching, but we are trying to do it ourselves. Now, the, tech, the next target is not talking about only Indonesia, not talking about in European Union or other developed countries that are able to reach that. But we have to make sure that other countries all around the world are able to do that. 
And that's where the G20 has to show uh, its leadership in many ways, because the next target is 70% of uh, global population by mid to 2022. Our feeling is quite simple. No one is safe unless everyone is safe. You need only one people bringing, uh, one person bringing the, the virus all over the world, and then you have a new variant again. And this is what's happening. So we have to make sure that this is being done. How to do it? Then the question of, for instance, uh, accessibilities. Uh, if you have money, but you don't have, uh, you're not able to, to get the, the vaccine simply because you don't have the production, the fact of life is the production capacity of the world is not sufficient. Uh, there, if, if, even though it's uh, several pharmaceutical industries, so we will not be able to, to, to um, uh, bring uh, the numbers that are needed for the rest of the world. So precisely, you need to have production hub. You need to have uh, ability also to, uh, to, to produce it. And later on, the question of uh, dissemination of the vaccine itself. And this uh, comes to the question of uh, uh, the TRIPS waiver. Uh, once again, if we really think that we are in this planet together and we really think that this is a pandemic, this is an emergency situation, then of course, exemption should be given in the sense. And once again, this is, has been discussed in W2 and you know our feeling on this issue. Uh, but once again, I, I, I used to be ambassador uh, of Indonesia to WHO. And at that time we were experiencing the H1N5 uh, virus uh, in 2009, 2010. Right. Mm -hmm. And we managed to, to settle it uh, because we were, were not very happy and we brought the pharmaceutical industry, including ours. The question is simple, unless we provided a uh, sufficient vaccine for everyone, then this thing will continue, the pandemic, will, there will be mutation. Now, that's why in our, uh, in our um, presidency, we wanted to work in all parts of the world, coming up with concrete things, working with WHO, uh, we are also following through the Rome Declaration on creating this health uh, finance and uh, health minister task force uh, for readiness in terms of preparedness, responsiveness for future pandemics. So they are pulling off resources in case developing countries later on are needed. Because uh, the, the, the idea that has to be incepted in all our minds is that we are all in this together. Right. And if we want to recover, then there's no other choices but to collaborate together. We can't have nationalism in terms, we cannot have uh, efforts that only think about our own backyard without thinking about what's uh, the impact on others. I'm not trying to preach here and there, but once again, uh, we are also working on the COVAX facilities. My Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ibu Ratno Marsudi, is one of the co-chair of the COVAX facility, which has successfully distributed 800, 811 million doses to 144 countries and entities. We're going to continue on that. In ASEAN, we work on initiative in pandemic mitigation to strengthen regional health resiliences. So there are lots of things that we are trying to yeah. do. Yeah, and, and good luck for that, because as you said, <laughs> this is very, very crucial. And of course, the TRIPS waiver remains a controversial issue uh, in the West uh, here in Europe as well. So good luck with convincing countries of a very important initiative that has been tabled by India and South Africa. And now Indonesia is, of course, joined in. Uh, within the G20 framework. Um, Ambassador, let's move on to your second, I shouldn't say second priority, but also a very important point, which is uh, the green transition and of course, climate change COP27 coming up later on this year. But as we've said, and you've said, you don't want to go into the details, but the fact is that there is a lot of disagreement and discord about in this area as well. I mean, within Europe, we have this question, and today it's being discussed, actually, taxonomy question about nuclear and uh, gas. And of course, Indonesia also blocked exports of coal, at least for a bit. So there is a lot of national debate going on in, uh, in this sector as well. So once again, what can Indonesia do in the G20 framework that will get the conversation moving further on? Uh, the fact remains that um we need to transition to a sustainable type of energy. And I think, I think uh, all countries in the world would like to do that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fact of life. But the question is, there are those that have the resources, but do not have the, the technology. There are those that are able to, to and have the, intent, the good intention of trying to do that, but there's not sufficient investment in terms of, uh, uh, what do you call it, sustainable uh, uh, energy type of uh, energy. So this is the thing that we need to work on. Question of how we are trying to do it. 
then there's uh, no other choices but collaboration. And that's why uh, in our presidency, we are focusing on what can be done by countries, what can be done uh, jointly collaborate by countries and private sector and NGOs and by uh, philanthropists. Uh, the idea is that, look, any ITBT type of projects or program activities concretely, we're talking about concrete, we're not talking about it's already been decided in many uh, um, convention, UNFCC, the COP, uh, either on the target of 1.5 uh, degree or two degree or a certain target a year. Mm. But the question is, well, I'm a, I'm a supporter of Nike, simply just do it. We, we're not in the stage of uh, faulting one or the others. In our case, for instance, just a simple example, we are now moving toward electricity. Uh, the first Sherpa meeting in December, we're using all electric cars for all the Sherpa. So we are trying to show also a leadership. President Jokowi is planting a lot of mangroves. The question of, of uh, climate uh, issues, energy is also not only on mitigation, but adaptation. So if you are able to, to and we're, we're fulfilling the target much more higher than many uh, countries, including in Europe. We have done a lot uh, three times much. I can give you the data, uh, but just simply the fact is that uh, we need to work together on this issue. And, and once again, um, any type of efforts that contribute to reaching uh, this target uh, that we have decided on COP or on Glasgow or on, on G20 uh, is most welcome. But it's, it, I think the time for, for debating is way past because right. our constituency is asking for concrete things. And that's what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And that's also what the young people are, are demanding exactly. very, very strongly across the world, actually, it has to be said. So uh, no debates, just do it is, is the message. Um, Pajani, let's move on to another very important part of your G20 priorities, which is digital transformation. And you talked about the digital economy, we are talking to each other digitally, thank God, we have that <laughs> access so we can actually connect even in these very difficult and challenging times. And of course, Indonesia uh, is way ahead of many other countries uh, in terms of adaptation, adoption of digital technology. To walk, talk us a little bit through your priorities in this area, where will you be putting uh, the emphasis? Well, I think the issue here is how to ensure that digital transformation will be able to contribute in terms of uh, creating more prosperity in, in terms of trying to um, grow uh, much better uh, as an uh, after effect of the pandemic. So the idea is to, to ensure that, look, uh, let's use digital in many areas. We are going to discuss it in the employment working group and health, education, youth, labor, uh, science and business uh, engagement group, um, the idea is uh, as simple as this, um, if you can be more effective and efficient. And, and the fact uh, remains that uh, in this uh, time of pandemic, we have no other choice but to, to rely on digital. Uh, and this is also in terms of e-commerce, in terms of uh, productivities. So there are lots of things that can, can be discussed uh, within the purview of digital. Uh, not not only in terms of um, working together between incubators or networking between uh, apps, uh, but uh, the issue of development, the issue of research, the issue of trying to utilize digital to the utmost in terms of ensuring that you are able to, to go to the future in much more smoother way. That's actually the idea. There are going to be a lot of things that are going to be there discussed, for instance, the question of data flow, the question of safety, safety in the digital uh, realm, um, question of transparencies, a lot of our issues uh, is uh, under the umbrella of digital. Um, of course, we are quite open to uh, any ideas that really would contribute in terms of uh, recover more stronger in the future. That is the key word. Let me give you two uh, two ideas on that that are dear to my heart. One is, of course, the digital divide uh, mm -hmm. between many countries uh, and also the gender divide on digital as well. So perhaps Indonesia can put some focus on that as well, which I think are two crucial issues as if we are going to have this uh, recover together, recover stronger. What do you think? No, no. On the, on the gender issues, uh, I think... Uh, we're going to have at least three uh, big uh, meetings on gender. First, uh, we're going to have the ministerial uh, meeting on women empowerment, which is uh, government uh, officials. 
we're going to have the woman empower which is the grouping of uh, business women uh, it's also going to be a large type of uh, meeting and of course we have the w20 you know how many uh, women organization uh, in indonesia I, I'm, I'm uh, not only surprised, it's not so easy to, to count it because there are hundreds and you, you can only pick two chairs, two co-chairs in the terms of trying to have this W20. But the idea is not only talking about uh, how to empower women in the business sectors, how to use digital, but also the question that sometimes we tend to forget, the vulnerable, the disabled. We're also working on that. We found out in our research that uh, disabled women are more productive than those that are more healthier in the, in the factories because maybe those that are healthier, I'm sorry if I have to say this, takes a lot of coffee break in a sense, but, right. but that's, that's really something. Like men that, do, like men do. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? And sometimes diplomats. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. No, but, but to be serious on this, uh, uh, we are focusing on a lot of things that can be done on, for instance, small and medium enterprise, uh, where we have experience uh, on, on uh, the women uh, sectors on this. Uh, the digital divide is an issue also. That's why we're also focusing on small and medium, micro, small and medium enterprises, right. because that is quite clearly related. It's not a simple case of uh, the old uh, story of having uh, enough financial uh, to run a business, but how to also train them in order to use all the apps the new e-commerce in, in terms of trying to market their products. Uh, now everyone is doing it. And we found out that uh, the number, uh, the one that, that uh, makes sure that all economies in all crises, including Asian financial crisis, the European crisis in 2008, all survived simply because of the, the very good role of small and medium enterprise, exactly. because they have been the backbone of any economies. Not exactly. the big guys, but the small guys. And there's a the question of financing, obviously. Right, uh, yeah. but now if we've passed the question of financing, we're now going ahead on the question of ensuring that they have the right productivity, they have the right digital tools in terms of the marketing part of it. Because right. you can't do the conservative way of doing it, especially during pandemic. So you have to be more innovative, more creative. So yeah. once again, yeah. not trying to preach, but that's a fact of life. And we're just following the stream, the wave of, of, of uh, future. Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I've got two questions already coming in, and I'll put them to you uh, in a minute, uh, Pajani. But please, uh, all to participants, a message. Please do send in more questions. Uh, we have the privilege of having a co-sherpa here, so there are lots of questions that I can ask, but I really want you to put some uh, questions to us as well. Pajani, we're talking here. I'm in Brussels. You're in Jakarta. But I was wondering, in terms of how you think the European Union um, the 27 countries of the European Union, but the European Union per se collectively as well, how that can be a partner for you in, you know, fulfilling some of your goals and uh, your ambitions for the G20. I think the key word that, that President uh, Joko Widodo uh, have uh, elaborated during, uh, in Rome is the need for the G20 to bring concrete deliverables, project, program that are concrete in terms of things that really matters to the common people. And this is where we can collaborate, where the EU has the comparative advantage on certain field, uh, while we also, because uh, I also experienced, for instance, what we call the tripartite approach, whereby, um, for instance, we're not talking about working between the G20 countries, but we're also talking about how G20 can also give a trickle down effect or also um, cooperate with other countries outside the G20 membership because the world G20 is only uh, 20 members uh, where you still have if you counted the UN membership of 193 then you have 170 something countries that are outside the G20 and this has to be brought into the realm and that's where the EU can also help in terms of uh, collaborating. We might have the expertise, for instance, in helping uh, Pacific Island countries, but EU has the resources to send our, our expertise, for instance, in certain ways. You know, you don't have to think also about big things uh, only, meaning coming up with a plan, uh, factories or, or, or an environmental, uh, what do you call it, uh, energy plan, but you could also come up with certain things. Uh, there are lots of tripartite approach whereby 
collaboration between EU uh, and with other develop, uh, developing countries in helping other least developed countries, for instance. This is the, the, the type of thing that we want to make sure. Um, what thing is more important is we will focus on these three priorities issue. That's where and we, everyone can find what type of projects that they are most comfortable with. And mm -hmm. we'll work on that. Okay. So it's, uh, it's an open type of flexible approach. So the more the merrier. And as long as you come up with a contribution that are quite, uh, it can be in, in different form, for instance, and with the different expertise. Right. Uh, Pajani, let me now, uh, I'll come back to you with a few of my own questions uh, later on, but there are a couple of questions, actually three very good questions here that I'd like to put to you. So this is from Kampa Pradipta is no more and uh, talking about the vast ocean uh, resources uh, that have a great potential for alternative source of global growth. So the question is, is the blue economy a priority for Indonesia in the G20? The answer is simply yes, uh, because once again, when you're talking about uh, making the economy much better, we're not talking about uh, green uh, industries also. Uh, we're talking about the blue economy. We have to make sure the maritime issues are there because there are lots of countries that are dependent on that. And that's why we wanted to also to bring the uh, small island developing countries into the discussion. We are the first one that brought them here. I mean, brought them into the realm of the G20. We find it quite interesting, you know, when people are talking about climate change and and they are not part of the discussion in the G20. Uh, we have this uh, 20 membership, but we're also having this invited uh, guests also, right? Uh, and they are the most affected. Uh, for us, we have 17,000 plus plus island, but there are countries that have only a few islands. And because of climate change uh, with, with the, the, the ocean, uh, the wave getting higher and higher, uh, they are losing their land mass. So that's why they should be part of the discussion. And that's why the discussion is not addressing only climate change, but ensuring also that there are economic, uh, um, blue economy uh, that are also being covered in the whole uh, discussion or the debate. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to hear the Azan in the background as well, Pajani. It takes me back to my days in Jakarta. So uh, that's very nice. Um, a question here from Jan von Herf. It is about health. And he says, um, health is also a theme within the German G7 presidency. So how are G20 and G7 actions linked and coordinated in this respect? It's a very good question about how you will be working with G7 president uh, Germany. Well, one thing for sure is uh, even uh, before we took our the presidency from uh, Italy, we have already been in contact with Germany before Germany took over the G7. Uh, I have a close uh, discussion, uh, um, collaboration with our German colleagues, uh, the Sherpa. Uh, we have already outlined what we are trying to do actually even last year and the German also did that. So actually, um, uh, and we have a discussion. I just gave a presentation in the OECD uh, just last week, OECD ambassadors also. And uh, we are in line what we're discussing uh, in our presidency in the G20 and, and uh, the German presidency in the G7. Priorities is there. So we are focusing actually on concrete things and there are ways and means to do it. We just, uh, once again, uh, if that the question uh, is simply is answered by yes, we are <laughs> collaborating closely with our German colleagues. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So there's a question also coming from Todd Buell, and he's from the news agency Law360. And the question is, what role does the Indonesian G20 presidency see for the OECD in coming up with a global framework on carbon tax, uh, carbon pricing? Would this role be similar to the role the OECD played in the inclusive framework uh, historic deal on corporate tax last October? Well. Yeah. Thank you very much, Todd. Um, um, one thing for sure, like I mentioned before, we had uh, I had give a presentation to OECD ambassadors uh, just last week. Uh, I was supposed to go to Paris, but with this uh, all over the world, Omicron, um, we are very careful in Indonesia as well as part of the world. Um, so we had the VTC discussion, but with OECD, uh, OECD has always been invited to G20 uh, um, gathering uh, in past presidency also. 
So we have been engaging since early last year uh, on uh, various aspects, not only this issue of uh, tax, uh, carbon tax or pricing or finance uh, track. Uh, people have already been in close discussion with the OECDs, uh, but there are others working groups that are uh, already been involved, for instance, on anti-corruption, uh, development working group is um, uh, the idea is uh, as, as simple as look uh, whatever not only OECD what other uh, organization that can contribute to the, our agenda will of course will be most welcome uh, and based on their comparative advantage also for instance uh, like the United Nations system UNESCO is also helping in certain part on culture for instance uh, ILO is uh, helping in terms of uh, the discussion on labor uh, on uh, empowerment, um, the WTO, I mean, World Tourism Organization, of course, WTO and others. So there are lots of, we are, we are quite flexible and we're quite open in terms of the working group, uh, whoever or, or which organization can contribute to the, to the discussion is most welcome. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, the issues also has to be discussed and decided upon by all 20 membership whether mm -hmm. how far you want to go. Uh, we are in the business, uh, in our diplomacy, we have always been in the business of finding consensus, of finding a bridge building type of diplomacy. We have proven ourselves. I, I was the president of the Security Council in during the tough time of GCPOA as well as others, you know. But we managed to, we managed to navigate because uh, we do have credibilities. We are friends with everyone. We do not be belong to any alliances. Uh, our alliances is with the people of the world. And of course, we, we wanted to make sure that the world is a much better place to live. Uh, and that's where we have to work together. So right, uh, right. I, I but, hope that answered the question of thought well. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I think so. But I, I was just wondering, um, so many different organizations and countries you're sort of expanding and you said you're making g20 more inclusive but in the end uh, i guess it is the 20 countries that have the final say right well yes but that does not necessarily mean that uh, we are not hearing from everyone precisely that's why we invite the pacific island forum and the caricom we want to hear their views we are also inviting the islamic development bank for instance, so that gives the nuance of what's happening in the Middle East. Of course, Africa is represented by the African Union. Senegal will be joining us. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Nepal, the chair of Nepal. Can you imagine Belize is now uh, representing the CARICOM and Fiji has never been uh, once in their lifetime been in the G20. So we're giving them a voice. Absolutely. Uh, inclusivity does not uh, only cover countries. Inclusivity also covers those that are really wanting to contribute. But we're not in the business of trying to uh, ensure that G20 become a more larger gap. We want to make sure that we are united, uh, united in addressing the global challenges. And, and then the voices are been... heard. I mean, the message exactly. I'm getting for you is that voices are heard. Um, let me get the, another question coming in from Emily Steiger. And she's talking about connectivity concerning the EU Global Gateway Initiative and what role this may play in the G20 process. Uh, could there be cooperation within G20 complementing initiatives? It's true, uh, Ambassador Jani, there are so many connected connectivity initiatives there. Obviously, China's Belt and Road, Europe's Global Gateway, but ASEAN has a master plan as well. Uh, and uh, Japan uh, has a plan as well. So I was just wondering, it's a good question. Do you, do you think we can bring this under an umbrella so there's less of this kind of conflicting agendas, duplication, more synergies are needed perhaps in initiatives on connectivity? Well, our approach is, uh, and this I have already um, um, voiced out. Uh, we, we, I think we came up, I came up with the, the first uh, uh, methods of work in our first SEPA meeting. We have a SOFA talk actually. Uh, Shada, where we are sitting in the sofa, the G20 membership, no secretary, no uh, formal recording, and every, everyone can say whatever they want. It's an open discussion type of a thing. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a uh, what we used to have always in, not we used to have, we always have in Indonesia where we we sit in the in the cafe, we talk, uh, settle our differences here and there. Now, what we want in our presidency is not long leaders' declaration. 
uh, if I may ask uh, uh, people, uh, including my own colleagues there uh, here in the in the in the, the in the FTC, do they know what's inside all the leaders declaration of past presidencies? When we are having trouble trying to um, uh, explain in the Indonesian language, when you have a paragraph that are 50 lines long, a sentence that are 10 lines long without subject, object, and others. So we don't want that. We want to something to have a clear type of thing, simple messaging. So without putting uh, labeling, whether it's EU or it's uh, China or Indonesia or ASEAN. But the, the main point is the connectivity issue itself, the substance itself. Now we're not talking about, for instance, on health, uh, give a simple example on health. Uh, what is needed actually? What is needed is to make the world much healthier. Whoever do it, what type of organization contributed it? I think that's not the question. That's not the, the relevant here. Uh, having labeling or putting your name on certain initiative. What is important for people in Brussels that are in the street of Brussels or the street of Jakarta is that they have vaccine, they have a jab of vaccine, they are healthy. Right. They don't care whether this initiative is under the labeling of Indonesia, or what you call or ASEAN or EU or, or whatever. So you're rejecting. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit blunt here in the saying that uh, oh. I think that is what people are, are looking for. I hope I can do it. But once again, Indonesia is, uh, is only the president, and that needs also the work of all 19 members. And I'm quite sure that uh, um, uh, this time, uh, I think everyone will be working together closely because we, we are in the same boat, like it or not. So you're and rejecting... Everybody wants to wear masks for the next five years. Uh, no, Sada. we don't, that's for sure. <laughs> and we, I do want to meet you uh, and not just talk to you virtually. So in a sense, uh, Ambassador Jani, you're rejecting the idea um, of geopolitical competition in terms of uh, vaccines or connectivity or digital. It's about working together. Um, let me give you a few more questions, put them to you. So there's a question from uh, uh, the ambassador of Philippines, Eduardo de Vega, and he says, you said we've gone beyond the blame game when it comes to climate action. And um, does this mean, he asked, that the first world and developing countries are all of the same position on this? Um, Pajani? I think that's a very tough question, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Eduardo the Fega. I think I know this, uh, my good friend. Uh, once, once, once again, I think, um, well, people can come up with statement here and there, but one thing for sure that everybody is looking for him, even people in Manila, in Quezon City, in other places uh, around the world, they. They wanted to have a result. I think this is what we, uh, the responsibility of us diplomats, is of us delegation is to ensure that uh, the job is done. Um, I think it's time for us to really collaborate. It's time for us to really work together. So that's what I meant by, by look, uh, let's us really find projects that really can contribute in addressing this issue of climate change. I think that is the key word. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. So there's a question from Ian Graham, and he's a journalist on working on health and safety and environment issues. And he asks a question uh, which says, could a global health structure include some form of world health service that would share resources and provide worldwide health care free of direct charge to the patient? Hmm. This is a, a tough question uh, with a lot of uh, points. Uh, but a good idea, perhaps. It's a good idea, once again. Um, but one thing for sure, uh, for me at least personally, I, I would say that um, the point is, let's try to iron out all the differences in trying to address what is really needed. What is the fact of life shows that vaccination rate is still low in many uh, developing countries. That's the fact. The fact shows that there are not uh, enough vaccine going around in certain part of the world, right? The fact shows that even though you have resources, at the first stage of the COVAX facility, there are, um, um, there are not enough resources. But now the resources is there. But the question is how to ensure that you have the jab, how to ensure that you are able to vaccinate. Uh, there are places that are quite far away, there are uh, various uh, distribution uh, hurdles in the sense. 
And this is where I think we need to work together. Uh, and once again, uh, every country has their own health system. And I, I'm not in the, in the basis of judging which one works or not, because uh, the facts shows also uh, policies uh, might vary and with the different results. Uh, but one thing that the people of the world would like to see is that the world would be uh, safe for everyone and we'll pass this uh, uh, issue of COVID-19 in, in the next year, come next year, for instance. So uh, I don't know whether I could uh, answer this very technical question, uh, but uh, for us, uh, we'll, we'll, we wanted to work. We wanted to work together. We wanted to make sure, and the first step of the, the work is um, ensuring that there is this uh, uh, health task force, health and finance minister task force being set up, uh, which will, would uh, inshallah uh, come out with uh, sufficient uh, preparedness uh, and prevention uh, for future pandemic. Let me ask you, Pajani, too, because we're coming to the end of our conversation and mm. thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. Let me just ask you the mood in uh, Indonesia at the moment. I've been reading some of your papers and it's quite excited about the G20. There are lots of conferences, there have been these uh, women's groups that have been set up. So our, uh, is the domestic opinion actually quite galvanized and quite enthusiastic about your presidency as well and putting forward ideas and you'll have to meet their expectations as well as the international expectations, right? Well, of course, once again, uh, we have to work with everyone to make sure that this is a success in terms of not only the holding of the uh, conferences itself, but also the substance itself. And it's not an easy task, particularly since we wanted to have concrete things. Uh, I, 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 I'm a diplomat. I'm in the business of uh, making a lot of declaration uh, in my whole career. But now the, the game has changed uh, a bit in terms of we want to have something concrete. Not, in, not only full stop and commas, or not only words or sentences, so, so to say. Now, this is quite, uh, so we have to manage expectation definitely. But one thing for sure in terms of Indonesia, everything is in full support uh, of uh, what uh, we wanted to do. Uh, and uh, we had also several rounds of discussion with my colleagues in G20s also. Uh, the approach, I think we share, uh, we, we didn't create these priorities uh, out of the thin air uh, as such. Actually, we're, we're following up uh, the Rome Declaration itself, and we're trying to taking the paragraph uh, uh, sentences, the commitment there, for instance, and then translating into concrete things. Right. For instance, and you have this uh, target of 40 and 70%. Right. So what next? You can't make a saying uh, just a target, simply a target for the sake of target. And that's where we need all the help. We need the help of the media. We need the help of the NGO. We need the help of the philanthropists. Uh, government, private sector, pharmaceutical, everyone has to be jumping into the same bandwagon. For us, uh, that's why we're having this uh, in various parts of Indonesia uh, to also, and I'm, 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 I'm glad to say that we have the support of, of, of many of our constituencies, otherwise I would be out of a job. <laughs> right. But just my final question to you, uh, Ambassador, really about the future. So India will take over the G20 presidency from you in 2023. So two Asian, major Asian countries for two years successively. That's quite important. What kind of legacy do you think would you like to leave for India to take over and run well, with? Uh, Shad, I'm not in the basis of uh, legacy or not legacy. We are just a humble Indonesian. For us, if we can make sure that the G20 works effectively, efficient, if we can deliver on the wishes of the, our constituencies and the people of the world, I think that's a good enough legacy in trying to, if we are able to, to get together, work together, addressing these three main issues, I think that's, that's a legacy enough for me, at least. Um, I think the legacy, uh, are, we leave it to the prophet. <laughs> so when you talk about legacy, um, I don't know. Uh, but I'm quite sure one thing that I want to underline is I'm quite sure that uh, the next president of India is more than capable in following up on all the many uh, G20 uh, past presidency uh, decision and commitment. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, my colleague uh, from India will take over. And of course, after that, Brazil. Um, I, I think they're all great in their own. Uh, they have the capacity, they have the, 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 the willingness and the intention of making sure that uh, things goes through. And as you know, we are a Troika anyway.
Troika as well. And thank you so much, Ambassador Johnny, for your time and for giving us such a complete picture of your ambitions. Just do it, as you said. And to quote you, humble Indonesia, having very high ambitions for the G20. So we wish you luck. Uh, we hope to talk to you again uh, very soon. And I'd like to thank EPC and uh, the uh, Indonesian mission to the EU for this dialogue as well to all of you participants for joining in and for asking some very, very important questions. So take care, everyone. Stay safe and stay healthy. Ambassador Johnny, once again, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you, Ibusada. Thank you, Ambassador Hadi and all colleagues uh, that has been uh, coming up with the question.